Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Tony Levitas. I'm the director of the undergraduate public policy concentration here at Watson. And it is really a great pleasure and a great honor, and we're really very, very lucky to have Angela Blanchard here with us this semester. Um, Angela um, started off, I think, as a, a, the chief financial officer of one of the original settlement houses in Houston. At the time, the organization had a budget of $7 million. Ten years after that, the organization had grown to $40 million. And by the time she left it, it is now the largest community development organization in America, or one of the largest, mm. with a budget of 300 million, 71 locations, a staff of 1,500 and um, 7,000 volunteers. So she runs social services in Houston, uh, in part because uh, the people who run Houston don't want to think about this and would prefer to give the mo their money to Angela to do this for them. Um, over the course of turning uh, neighborhood centers into Ripley Baker, as it is now known, uh, Houston, uh, southern part of America, was hit with uh, more and more intense hurricanes. And more and more of that washed into Houston. So Angela became an expert in emergency relief and integration of refugees. From that work, she has moved outside of Houston and is now an internationally recognized expert in providing emergency uh, relief services to refugees and integrating them into the larger societies over time. So she is extremely um, accomplished and extremely creative and extremely capable organizationally, a rare mix. Um, she considers herself a practitioner and I think is sometimes a little intimidated by the expectations of the academic environment, but I can tell you that in the course oh, of... Uh, Thank in, you for getting that out of the way, Tony. Right. In the course of a, a, a lunch, she produced more schematic diagrams that made perfect academic sense than I've ever seen. Uh, so it is with a great pleasure that I, I turn the floor over to Angela. I Thank should you. also say I'm going to that Angela will be running in the basement of the apartment building in which she's living at 127 Watermitten Street, an open evening every Thursday afternoon from 4 to 6, called Good Company, where people from the academic community, from the activist community in Providence, anybody who's really interested are welcome to join the conversation. Yes, thank you. Thank right. you. I'm glad he got that, like she's real nervous about the academic setting thing out of the way. I told him to tell you that I spoke Texan uh, because um, it is really a different language, it is. And a lot of words in Texan are three syllables. There are only one syllable here. So um, you'll adjust, though. Uh, the same way I'm adjusting to your wonderful weather. Um, so style is real important in Houston, and uh, we think about, you know, dressing up and all that a lot. And I've figured out the formula here is that I just get up and put on all my clothes. I put on all my clothes, and then I'm just going to rotate the layers. Every day I'll look different, but I'll really have on everything I brought. That's, that's the F. It works really well. And I, listen, before I left, some folks back home, you know, they had to make fun of the fact that I was going to the itty-bitty, teeny little bitty state. And so um, I had some big-time Texans explain to me 
that uh, not too far in the past when Texans wanted to brag about the size of their ranches, that they used to say, describe them in terms of how many RIs. <laughs> so people would, this is not, is a true story. Because, uh, you know, in Texas, we like to talk about how big everything is. Uh, and I just want to say, we, when we screw up, we, we, it's big too, you know. <laughs> so, um, so this story is really, um, it's a, I'm going to tell it in a sort of crazy chronological way because I'm not a scholar, but I'm hoping you know, like the people that spent the night at the Holiday Inn, if I hang out here a while, I'll start to make better sense. But for now, you're just going to get it as it happened. So I have this notion now we're all living in a time of upheaval, and it's really important to pay attention to things uh, that are falling apart around the world. And I don't think we pay attention to them to be down about it. I think we pay attention because there are lessons there. And upheaval seems to be the way of the world. And we're seeing fires and floods and flows of people and people uprooted and losing their history and their home and uh, everything, community, and misplaced, displaced to cities. So that can't just be the Houston story, but it definitely has been our story. I see it happen everywhere in the world. And now, because of my obsession with what happens right after things fall apart. I've been invited uh, to Germany, to Lebanon, to Jordan, to Australia seven times, to the UK, and then closer to home to places like Charlottesville and Ferguson. My son says I'm not really a disaster responder. He says you're just sort of like a disaster trailer, Mom. You just trail along behind all the sad things and the miserable things in the world. But it, it really isn't glum at all because what I believe is so exciting is that cities are stepping up and figuring out how to create landing places and on-ramps to opportunity for people that flow in. Um, when you look at the study of cities, and I have all these smart friends that do that a lot, uh, they think about flows of goods and information. They think about cities as containers for uh, innovation for development for all kinds of things but really in my world a city is um, like a place that where people can be nurtured where people can be educated where they can become connected more importantly where they can create new lives out of their own imagination and for me it's not I love to brag about Houston's diversity and I'm going to tell you a little bit about that but the most exciting thing about it is that it's not just that you can come to Houston, you're welcome in Houston. And I think creating a welcoming cities all over the world is going to be necessary uh, because people are coming, flows of people are coming. And Houston sits, um, when it's not underwater, uh, Houston sits at the intersection of several big things. One of those things is migration, the other is mass urbanization, and the third thing is climate change. We are sort of... Um, as someone helpfully tweeted me during Harvey, uh, it was all our fault. Uh, Houston, oil and gas capital of the world. It's good we were being flooded. Teach us a lesson for producing all that crude oil. And, um, and then at some point I suggested that that individual without Houston would be sitting outside naked and cold. Um, the, yeah, so I, I get a little touchy. So this was, uh, this was 2001. And Allison, which wasn't even a hurricane, a tropical storm, caused almost $8 billion worth of damage and flooded our entire city. This is what it looked like in downtown in the tunnels. This is what the basement of the medical center looked, looked like. It shut down every major institution in Houston. It was a non-event. Now, if it had happened in New York, it would have been called super, super something. And it would have been the bomb something if it had hit New England, I guess. But it was just Houston. So it was just a tropical storm, $8 billion of damage, and it taught us a lot. Don't put things in the basement, create these big flood walls, lower all of our streets and our highways so they become like canals so we can move as much water as possible out of the city as quickly as possible. So that didn't really uh, change much for what happened next because Katrina hit New Orleans, and all of you saw 
uh, people in New Orleans wait for help to come, and it didn't. And after a few days, Houston stepped up and said, everybody in New Orleans, there are neighbors, in my case, my relatives. I didn't mention that I was Cajun. If Look it up. It's not just a spice. <laughs> <laughs> There's the actual people. Um, so we were welcoming our neighbors to Houston, and we did it in a matter of a few days. And still New Orleanians talk about what it was like to come in on buses and see Houstonians lined up on either side of the street with signs that said, welcome, we meant it. Um, our organization agreed that we would do the long-term case management. We would coordinate that. Within a matter of 48 hours, we had about 37,000 new families to work with. And we told May the mayor, then Mayor White we'd work until everyone had a home, and that took five years. So, but this was the floor of the Astrodome in 2005. And then um, we worked one family at a time on permanent, re you know, and I'll tell you, Houston, this is what Houston has to offer. We're good at these three things. You get a job, a house, and a car. It's a city built for work to work. It's not glamorous. In New Orleans, if you've ever been there, you probably had a really good time. It's a fabulous place. Everybody there has deep roots. Um, whereas 70% of the people in the greater Houston region weren't born in Houston, 70% of the people in New Orleans were born there. Their parents were born there and their grandparents. It's a city of deep roots and neighborhoods. So what we had to offer was a lot less than what people left behind. And it was painful, uh, but we were glad to do it. And here's what we learned from that. No one's coming. So when I go, wherever I go, that's the first thing I say to community practitioners, to people leading nonprofits, to city leaders, to anyone that cares about their city and their neighborhood. No one's coming. There's no one bigger, better, stronger, faster than you showing up to solve it when it gets way out of hand. Now, you'll want to believe there is. And before Katrina, I thought there was. That would happen. I thought if everything, anytime anything got too big for us, that the Calvary would be arriving. But it doesn't work that way anymore. It's when I came to understand that the institutions we had built weren't evolving fast enough and couldn't move quick enough to come to our aid, and that the job of responding in your city, in your community, is yours on the ground right where you are. It belongs to us, and we have to be prepared. There are, it's dawned on a lot of people since that time. I share this because I want you to know this is also a personal story. This was Bridge City after Ike, because we went right from Katrina, then Rita, then Ike. And this was everything my brother owned after we finished cleaning out his house in Bridge City. Uh, Rita took the roof off the business my parents had owned for 50 years, and I blew the windows out and shut down the printing company. So all along the Gulf Coast are my relatives, a couple hundred of them, and there's not been a storm that didn't touch someone in our family. So as these storms were hitting, one right after another on the Gulf Coast, another really dramatic thing was happening in Houston. Houston in the 80s was a biracial oil and gas southern freeway city. And the demographic change that uh, happened in Houston has been described as the most dramatic demographic shift of any major American city in the shortest period of time. So this is a uh, county that looked in 1960 like this. And as these changes were taking place, people were literally arriving from all over the world to a city um, that was growing at times in some years for some stretches, 11,000 people per month, both natural increase, uh, in-country inflows, and out-of-country inflows. It's how we got to be a city now where a fourth of the people were born outside of the country. So, and this is how we stack up with other uh, cities around uh, the country, around the US. So um, as a fourth largest city, and now arguably the more, most diverse city, um, the other exciting thing about this for me is when it happens with this speed, you don't really have time to make up a lot of stories about the people you meet. 
And whether Seth's daddy is, where Seth's daddy's from doesn't matter, because my daddy's from a little small town, his daddy might be from Lahore, but it doesn't make any difference because none of us in the region of us, over six million people, 70% weren't born in that region. So we don't share a past, we just share a future. And it's a forward-looking city anyway. When I first got here, several of the people at Brown proudly told me that Brown had been here before uh, the country started. You know, I was like, wow, that's pretty impressive. And, um, and I, I didn't know if I should say I come from a city where we basically bulldoze everything every seven years and rebuild the whole thing. <laughs> but um, but I, I mean, you know, it's not that I don't respect history. We just, we don't have much of it. So what happened in, 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 in the city was this fundamentally welcoming city. We had to think, what is it we do? So this still works. Uh, Houston has largely been owned, but not in, not in a controlling sense, but in a nurturing sense, by leaders that felt like we should, the city should work for everyone. And that commitment had been maintained for a long time. Now we had everyone in the city. So we had a very basic belief that there are three aspirations that define people no matter where I'm sticking by this, I'll be an evangelist for certain things. This is one. People want to earn. There's, I've not met a person yet that doesn't, wanna, doesn't feel there's something they have to offer, and they want to believe the world needs it. People want to learn. We all want to be treated as if we have the capacity to grow, acquire new skills and insights, add something to the world, and then belonging is absolutely critical. So when we define ourselves as a region, as we do, as a place, a welcoming place of opportunity for everyone, that includes anyone that shows up. And that definition of Houston is actually, uh, we've, we've made that work. And we do say there's enough to go around because if you have a city of 627 square miles and a county of 1,700 square miles, there really is enough. There's room for you in case you're thinking of moving. So, but our organization's response to that was to look at the most diverse neighborhood in Houston, Gulfton, because uh, Gulfton had been the focal point for every incoming group of people. So we could trace the pattern of migration to Gulfton. We knew who was coming and what country they were coming from if we watched the pattern of misery and unrest in the world. So we knew, we knew for example, when Cubans got afraid that their parolee status would change, they were coming, and they did. We knew when the Somalis were coming. We knew when Af folks were arriving from Afghanistan. We could predict it. And they all ended up in this one neighborhood. When we first opened this center, I'll tell you a, li I'll tell you a little bit about the, s the school there housed uh, 200 children from 42 countries of origin. So we did the planning for this center. One of the things that got the attention of the Obama administration uh, was, first of all, that we decided you couldn't transform a neighborhood on the back of one aspect. You really had to pull all the dimensions together. It had to be education, it had to be health. You couldn't, we've done so many neighborhood transformations and investments uh, expecting just one aspect to make it work. We decided that we would put it all together in this neighborhood that was where 17,000 people per square mile, which is four times denser than the center of the city. So, um, and we, and we made this place a real celebration of everything, of all the people that had come. When we did the planning for it, we did it in eight languages, Arabic, Urdu, Spanish, English, Vietnamese, Chinese. And then there were still a few where we had to have a second session with additional translators. So this is what it ended up being. Um, this is, I think, one of the shots from Grand Opening Day. By the way, in a, uh, I have a board member that says we get people to to write checks for things they won't vote for. And that's true, because um, private money uh, paid for that. And uh, we weren't shy about saying, in the greater Houston reason, we have an estimated 400,000 people uh, without permission slips to be in the country. Some had one, and the tricky immigration system failed them. Some never had one. But we were open and clear that Everybody got served here, and about 36,000 people come through that site. There's a school, a welcome center, immigration services, and a gathering place. And then what you can't see on this side is also a credit union, because we thought 2008 was a good year to open a bank. Because <laughs> it was a really underbanked community. You know, you got to move 
um, at the speed of need, right? So uh, with the New Neighbor School is an education innovation that we are really proud of because many of the children that arrive there may have only gotten to go to school a couple of years of their life, right? And maybe 10 years old, maybe formal schooling, uh, they were living in a camp and they didn't get a chance to go or in the country they came from they couldn't afford it. So this is the kids putting their heads together as they say, by the way, all these photos are owned uh, by me or the agency and everyone you see here, it's with permission. And I love these babies. So, <laughs> so, um, so this, is, uh, this is what it looks like. But the New Neighbor School is a landing place. It doesn't matter what age you are. You all start in the first year. You learn what a backpack is and what, your lock, what is a locker. You learn to speak the language. You make some friends. And more importantly, we teach your parents that no matter where they came from or how much they didn't like each other in that country, and this one, we're all in it together. And um, there's some really lovely breakthroughs that happen in the hallway. Um, so you have to be agnostic. I mean, for the, I think the beauty of the way uh, the immigration formula works now, you have to be a little agnostic about culture. So in the, when the settlement house movement began in the 18 and 1900s, it was all about abandon your culture, come here, be American, whatever that was. And now we have sort of a different formula. And it's say, we, basically, you have to sign up for democracy and sign up for capitalism, but your culture, you know, hang on to it. So that's what you see a lot in Houston. Um, and there's a, um, a whole sense that all of those cultures together really make a city more globally connected, and we think that's a strength. This was our site. Um, there are two meeting rooms and one gym full already, and then this was the outside gathering the day after President Obama announced DACA. We have an estimated 70,000 young people uh, caught in limbo, uh, now especially painfully awaiting their fate. Um, so one of the things we do is massive uh, events in which we have, we work with people on their status and reconciling where we can. So sometimes as a community practitioner, you can, you can build schools, you can give people a place to bank, you can work with them to think through their educational aspirations, you can get their credentials acquired in another country recognized in this one. Sometimes all you can do is say, I'm so sorry. Uh, this is where we are, and with all we know to do, this is the best we can do today. And um, I've worked for a very long time toward immigration reform and toward trying to convince people that um, it's really important to find a way to have people that are citizens and everything but the paper uh, for us to make that work, and we haven't been successful. Um, nonetheless, uh, we feel strongly, you know, we, we, this was actually a shot I took in Galveston after Ike. Someone uh, had lost their sign, so they hand wrote this sign. It says, Hard Times and Misery Saloon. Um, I don't recommend moving into that, but uh, we, we say one of the great lessons I've learned from the people that we work with uh, who faced all kinds of difficulty and hardship is that um, acceptance is really a powerful thing. This, whatever the reason, however the, we got here, is here we, here we are now, and how do we real, build our lives going forward. So uh, the creating a future out of our own imagination with what's available is really very much the inspiration of displaced people. When the slate's wiped clean. So, um, I got a chance to spend a, on two trips, a, a lot of time in, with practitioners in Germany. We all saw, the, I did note this is not my image, but we all saw uh, what ha was going on as uh, Syrians were flooding into Germany. And there was one simple paper I wrote about what we had learned from welcoming large flows of people that made its way uh, to a uh, lovely man, Jan Porksen in uh, Germany. And uh, he's a secretary of um, state secretary f it for resettlement, social integration, and a few labor and a few other things. And on the basis of that, um, we sort of found each other 
And I went to Germany to find the same thing that we find, uh, we find again and again. There really is enough to go around. And the Hanseatic Help Center was established because people arriving in Germany had very little. And that help center was put there to collect the contributions only in a lovely German fashion and in a partnership with private sector. They got extremely organized about it, um, extremely organized. I was stunned. It was in awe. Uh, it was a great lesson, though, because they inventoried everything they had. They boxed it up. They got it to every shelter in Germany that was in need of those goods. And when they had fulfilled all of those orders, they began shipping it to camps in Jordan and Lebanon. So it was just a stunning example and a particularly powerful example of collaboration. I really believe in the three-legged stool of philanthropic private, uh, phil private investment, uh, then the investment from the corporate sector and public sector. When the three come together, what you build is always going to be better than any one sector um, can do on its own. And um, this was also in Hamburg where they had the same issue we had after um, some of our disasters. Uh, so much volunteer help, uh, so many people that wanted to volunteer, many in the initial phase, and then it dwindles. So they were smarter about really collecting the information and trying to keep that volunteer, uh, the inspired and motivated volunteer effort um, uh, for the long haul. They have undertaken, I, I will say this, that I watched them um, do a beautiful job in the initial phase. In all of these disasters, when people are displaced, in the first phase, that's an emergency phase, and what matters most is safety and security. Everybody needs to be fed. We need to know who you are. There needs to be a roof over your head. But as time wears on and the integration phase comes in, you can't do that through command and control. It's a different, messier kind of activity. And in the first phase, this is uh, one of the places that people were living in airplane hangars at the old uh, airport, the old, at Tempelhof. It was, um, and Tempelhof is, um, it's in my opinion, a rather homely building, but they feel great affection for it. So there was no, no permission to decorate it in any way. So it was there in all of its great, great glory. And also in that building, people were very isolated because there was a wall around it and ostensibly for safety, but all of these barriers that we erect in the interest of safety are actually things that keep people feeling uh, left out and frightened. So the, um, the shelter I saw that was actually working extremely well was much smaller. I've also found if you can organize shelters in groups of displaced people into groups of 300 or less so that it can, they themselves can navigate the new community in which they find themselves, so these become far more functional and nurturing than these mass shelters where uh, after a time people just hunker down in really small areas out of fear. So this was run by Majdi Laktina, and Majdi is just a fabulous human being. He's a natural born community developer. I say my tribe because these are the people I look for all over the world. You drop them off in the middle of any mess and they sort it out. But Majdi himself was Damascan, so he had a huge affection for the people he was trying to help here. Um, and uh, he created within this balloon shelter the great spirit of belonging amongst the people that were living there. This was meant to be temporary, but it was three years occupied by 300 people before there could be sufficient housing located in, um, in Berlin for um, uh, they made it as attractive as possible, literally putting, you could stick anything up there. This was actually every time a person came to volunteer, when they peeled off their name tag, they stuck it to the wall here. So this was just kind of the wall of all the people that had shown up to help. Um, and then the welcome wall. I think there isn't a community center in the world. If you haven't figured out, I like camp shelters and community centers. I think all the real action in the and the world happens in those. But there isn't a community center in the world that doesn't have a wall with some children's art on it and that has to say something about home and welcome. Um, what I thought Majdi exemplified was one of the important lessons that um, really forms the foundation for welcoming. Anything that is not destructive, allow it. 
One of the great joys I get out of working in disaster areas is, you know, it's the only time when everybody says to hell with the rules. And we just do what's right for people. And Majni really understood that, you know, unless, unless it was going to be destructive, it should just be allowed to happen. And I've seen that in camps and other places where people just made up their minds to do what was best, what would enliven the communities. So this is an art project for the balloon shelter. This, um, this young man here and young woman on the other side really spent, they're street artists that spent the day um, with these children putting a, putting a mural together for, their, for the indoors. This community center mirrors in every way Baker Ripley. Uh, I thought it was kind of astonishing to travel so far and find a place in Berlin that looked just like our center and the same kinds of offerings and this, you know, integration really doesn't occur in auditoriums. It doesn't. Um, people don't feel welcome in a group of 10,000 people in a mass shelter. People feel welcome around small tables. In these community centers, wherever they are, it's the creation of that sense of belonging that makes them so powerful. Um, and then housing solutions that don't set people apart. When you have to build housing very quickly, most cities like to create these giant warehouses. And then later, they lament the fact that they somehow ended up with these ghettos they didn't mean to build. And it was like, but you did kind of build it, and then you told everyone they had to live there. So what did you think was going to happen? So the housing solutions that I love the most are smaller, they're faster, they're more uh, flexible, and they work better over the long haul because people aren't separated and we're from everybody else, and you can build them at the 340 scale instead of the 3,000 scale, which works much better. One of the things that happens in cities where people have stepped up to welcome, they've decided to help. They're doing all they can for people. I saw it in, New Orleans, in Houston after Katrina and heard it in Germany, hear it in Australia all the time. It's like, we want people to be grateful. It's like, we did everything we could. We're proud of it. We want them to be happy about it. And I think one of the most, the most important insights I've gained from spending lots and lots of time with people who've lost everything is that at every milestone there's gratitude and grief. That the minute there's a roof over your head again, the roof that you no longer have comes to mind. Every job that you get to do now brings to mind the workers, the co-workers you used to have that you no longer have. When you take your child to school, you think about the place that you used to be and the walk that you used to make to their school. So we have to understand that this is not, um, this is not just an upside story for the people we're trying to help. And appreciating, appreciating that makes us a lot more sensitive to the way we interact with them. So um, in, this is how folks hold a funeral in New Orleans. Uh, it's my people. Uh, this is the way we do it. Um, and I think the, uh, there's a really important ritual associated with funerals, but it also can be hauled out for other occasions. When I was in Lower Ninth after New Orleans, I learned a powerful lesson from a community developer there. And she, I said, what was the point where you felt like you could start to build again. And she said, in about a year after Katrina, they held a ceremony at the break in the levee. And the Treme brass band came to play. This is how it is in New Orleans. You don't have to put out an announcement. Stuff happens. And everybody showed up, and it was Memorial Day. So it became sort of the Memorial Day celebration. And that was the moment when they said goodbye to the people that were gone, and they knew they were never going to see again. And she thought, and that funeral for what was lost, not just the people, but the community that was lost, allowed us to feel that we could start again. And since that time, I've learned it's extremely important in whatever way to mark the passage of time since the loss, to acknowledge the anniversaries of displacement, to allow people to move along. Um, we get. Actually, when we say get over it, I think by now we should know that does not work. But it's that acknowledgement and celebration of what was and saying goodbye to it as we welcome in what's next. 
Um, unfortunately, not everybody knows how to do it like New Orleans, and they don't always have a band to go with it. And I feel sorry for everybody because of that. So uh, I've learned some really wonderful things in Australia, and I'm most proud to know this woman, Kieran Benson. Uh, she's just wickedly funny and a real misbehavior uh, like me. She swears more than I do, and that always makes me feel good. Um, this is uh, th that's, uh, just the number one vice among community developers. I just want you all to know that's how we get this done, four-letter words. So she, um, she started this thing in Queensland. You know, Australia cannot make up its mind. It really wants to be a globally connected you know, moving into the next century country, on the other hand, doesn't want anybody new to come. And this is very confusing for me because it's a big empty country. It seems to me they have a lot of room, but they've got mixed feelings about it all. On the one hand, Multicultural Development Association has resettled hundreds and hundreds of people and welcomed them with great enthusiasm and great celebration. This Lantern Day parade grew from a, a parade of about 15 people to a parade of like 15,000. And it's the Queensland way of saying not only welcome, but we're glad you're here wherever you're from. So I love the fact that um, they use art and drama and all kinds of celebrations like this to welcome people. And they are really smart about the housing too. It's like don't build a wall you can't take down. Don't put people in a confined space and uh, make a rule uh, that says, right now in Germany, for example, you can't move from one city to the, ne the next. If you've come in and you've been resettled in a city, you have to stay there. And you have to stay there until you don't need any more assistance. And then you can leave there. And you can understand the, the planning thought behind that. But from human resettlement, it's a wall you'll have to take down. And it's causing grief and difficulty every day. So. What Karen has come up with that I really find delightful is um, I think most of us would agree in the Western world, a lot of us are overhoused. You know, you probably have a room or two in your home you don't really need. You may own a garage apartment. You may own some property. And what uh, the Multicultural Development Association has done is offer the possibility to, to you to contribute that space to help you work to set aside that's part of your home and then create a separate ent entrance if you like uh, or to rent out at a sub-market price uh, housing that's needed. This addresses, first of all, it's fast, flexible, you don't have to wait for anything to be built. Second, it solves the problem of in integration beautifully because now you have an association with someone who truly is your neighbor. So um, there are, as you might imagine, a lot of tax complications. So the way they've approached this is just to go about it, go about getting a private ruling from the taxing authority. And she assumes that, of course, once that happens, others will want to do it too. Uh, but for now, they have a real estate company called Welcome Residential. And they have a mul multiple approaches to resettling the people that are coming into Brisbane. So I want to pause here before I'm a little intimidated to go on and talk about Lebanon and Jordan. Um, while I found affirmation for almost everything I consider to be a principle of community development, there are also countries that I don't understand at all. I understand all the people like me doing work there and all the people displaced and how they're faring. But the political environment and the decisions that are made are really, really foreign to me. And while it was an honor to work there and be there, uh, I want, before I go on to that, to really ask for your reaction to what you've heard so far. Okay. Yeah, the closer you get to the ground, the more happy and hopeful things are, right? Well, she's yeah. not happy and helpful in a larger sense, so it's just really. Yeah. Good. I'm really pleased to know that this kind of work is going on and going on all over. Yeah. What else? Anything? Question? Anything you're curious about? Yes. I was, I, I, I was uh, in New Orleans after Katrina, and one of the things that I was really struck with was that uh, while the area was completely devastated, the people that were still there, they, they, could, they knew how to figure stuff out. 
I mean, they had a real sense of how to get out of where they were. Yeah. It was just that it was so overwhelming. Yeah. And I, I, again and again and again, you know, I was just struck with how networked they all were. So we were, we were doing, you know, uh, renovations in houses and stuff. <coughs> And we'd say, oh, we need a chop saw in order to put up this molding. And so I said, well, I'll just call my cousin. And, you know, <laughs> and so they would call their cousin and yeah. he said, do you have a chop saw? No, but I know somebody who does it. Yeah. And that was, how they, that was how they solved all their problems. It was, and I was really struck with, with how the community itself knew how to heal itself yeah. in some way. Yeah. Uh, there was need for people to come there and help them because it was such an overwhelming thing. But that sense of they, they weren't just totally know yeah lost so one of the greatest markers one of the greatest uh, indicators of how quickly and effectively a recovery is going to occur is the strength of the connections that existed before the disaster and the displacement so that's why it's very important I think to allow people once they've arrived in a new country in a new place to move around as they see fit because if they can locate um, through their own choices, then they're going to reconnect where they can with community members and people they've known before. But what you're saying about New Orleans is absolutely true. Also true in Houston among the leaders because we, in some sense, we all grew up together as our city was blowing up into this big uh, giant place. And so we do a lot of things on the strength of a handshake and a, uh, a midnight phone call. Yes? I'm wondering, Angela, about the magic of your diplomatic skills <laughs> and of your tribe, as you said, yeah. because there's got to be opposition, some serious opposition on the ground. Uh, property, jobs, uh, worries about crimes. We, we heard a lot from the State of the Union yesterday that suggested that... Uh, you watched the State of the Union? I did. <laughs> 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 You know, this isn't the attitude of a lot of leaders in a lot of countries yeah. these days. So, how do you? I don't. That, that's one of the mis one of the mysteries of my uh, one of the great mysteries right now, and I expect you all are going to help me. You know, tell me why it works this way. I don't understand. I really don't understand how the headlines in Brisbane say one thing and on the ground it's so different. I don't understand how. Uh, Texas votes the way it does and writes huge checks uh, for this work. And, and wherever I go, Germany, I, I, Australia, I, I haven't been any place where that's not true. On the ground, face to face, one on one, neighbor to neighbor, we're still making it work over and over again. And uh, the, the, the only conclusion I could come to one day is we just outsource every mean spirited, small minded, petty little aspect of our nature to the political arena. And we just decided to have them go at each other every day while we went about building better cities. I, have, I don't understand it. Uh, Eric gave me a couple of good uh, possibilities and insights and uh, go ask him. <laughs> no, it's a mystery. I think, I think we, it's, it's, I don't know. I have board members of the organization that, you know, vote in ways that I find horrifying and then write large checks so that we can get this work done. Some of that represents what you, what I used to think of as this is a really deeply important debate, <coughs> not about whether or not people should be helped, but who should do it, and where the, the decision should be made about what that help looked like and how long it lasted and how did it work and so forth. And those were always conversations and, and arguments that I was delighted to have. Um, this is different, and it's as if some ugly, uh, really storm had moved over uh, that cast a great shadow on our work. But people go on helping on the ground. I'll um, I'll show you a little Harvey slide or two in a minute. You'll see what I mean. Yes, I think it's really interesting to um, listen to you and see again and again the centrality of like being a human and like being a person. Um, and being a citizen or a community member or a family member. And I think like kind of like addressing that, I like what, what I feel like the magic might actually be is the fact that you are on the ground and the politicians in many ways aren't. Mm -hmm. And you, you and, and people who work with you in your tribe, you, you see people and you talk to people um, 
like in the most horrifying times of their lives and I think yeah. if you actually see or experience or or are faced with someone regardless of how you vote you're going to yeah. want to do something about it well um, and Ruth you got it right I think that's it it all breaks down face to face doesn't yeah. it yeah it, does that work in New York City too I mean it I because people say New Yorkers are, are really rude and mean and and you know up front and uh, but you know if someone needs directions or if someone needs to know what train to take if you ask they'll yeah. probably get an answer yeah well I think I think that that's one of the great promises of cities is that as people with inflows of people and face-to-face -face connection and a constant we see someone every day um, then it, eventually whatever ideas we had about them just give way to the reality of the human being in front of us and then also, I think if you build a larger we, um, one thing I've never done is demonize. If I'm making a case for uh, the support of a community or a neighborhood or any group of people that is in need of help, I'm not pointing fingers at someone else because what's the point? You know, and, and in some sense, the concept we have of ourselves as a city and the fact that we say we're a place of opportunity for everyone, and that's why we came there. It was not for the weather. Um, so, you know, and we share that. So a person who came there starting at this rung of the ladder and the person at this rung of the ladder came for the same reason. Um, so I'll, I was just thinking of this billionaire story. I'll, I'll, tell, I'll tell it later. Um, so in Lebanon, I, I was invited to go to Burj al Shamali, which was one of the oldest um, uh, camps in, in, in the Middle East. And I was uh, really fascinated by the story of these three young people and eager to meet them and support what they were trying to do. Uh, Burj al Shamali has about 20,000 people, and they live in a confined space. And there's a marvelous article that's been written about this called Camp Code by uh, my friend Claudia Mansell. It's in Places Journal. But it talks about the way people in confined spaces still find a way to create community and build lives with some. Uh, some hope for the future. And these young people uh, who, are, who were born in this camp, because it was founded, I think, in 57, and they'll grow up there, and this will be their home. And they decided that they really needed, for the older women who had lost their spouses, there needed to be a way for them to earn some money. And that what they might possibly be able to do is grow the spices and herbs that they like to use, but because the camp is so packed and the footprint of the camp in all these years has not been able to expand, then they wanted to look for sturdy rooftops that would hold planters. But they had no map of the camp, and the only way you can get to the roof is to go through several people's homes because basically the camp's just like archaeological layers of displacement and resettlement. So when they realized there was no map, they decided to map the camp. And they're explaining this to me here because they were saying, first, first we thought we'd put these little cameras on a kite and then we'd let the kites up and then the, the, we'd photograph it that way, but that didn't work because this is the way it looks. This is the main street and every place else there looks like that. And then they said, well, we need something more stable. So they decided helium balloons would get it done. And, and so they began actually attaching small cameras, helium balloons running up through everyone's home, lifting the balloons up so they could take pictures. And then once they convinced the men with guns that surround them not to shoot the balloon, um, then this, that part of the project went really well. And they began mapping the camp. Um, but the, what they were most proud to show me, and this, uh, these are uh, Faraz, Amal, and Mustafa. And I still keep in touch with them. In fact, they sent me a message on WhatsApp during Harvey to make sure I was okay. And then they sent me another message election night to, to say, are you okay? <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> so I thought that was very sweet that they were concerned for me. Um, but this is their community center. And, uh, you know, when, when I was in Australia after the King Lake fires, which were really horrific, just a terrible, terrible... Uh, situation when people when everything's washed away or burnt away and you have to decide where you're going to rebuild I'm just stunned by 
over and over again I see that people invest first in the community centers as if they know if there's a place to come together they might be able to figure out the rest. So that was their community center and then this is Abu Wasim. Abu means grandfather. I'm sure he has an official name but everyone calls him that. He's kind of the unofficial guy of the camp uh, that runs it. So with his permission we had uh, gone out to raise money. MIT had invited these three young people to come and present their project at an innovation workshop to describe the way they used the balloons and the photographs they took to create a map of the camp so that they could find places to grow things. And then we had the elect we raised all the money and then we had the election. And they can't get in to the country. And so we we stay in touch and hold out hope that one day I'll get to greet them here. And, um, and actually, and don't tell anybody because, you know, I did sneak into that place. So <laughs> this is our little secret. So this is what you were talking about. This is actually from New Orleans. So do what you can with what you have. An improvisational spirit is really necessary for the world we're moving into. And I, I'm often in places the reason I love Burj Al Shamali so much is because I'm constantly going to a place in the U.S. and nonprofit people tell me, well, we just can't do that because we don't have the money. We don't have the resources. We don't have the technology. And I'm like, no, there'll be no whining because look what these kids <laughs> did. And this camp all the way across the world with very little. So improvisation is really for me a better word than innovation because improvisation is what, what forces us to look around us and to say, what do I have to work with? What's here? What are the strengths, resources, and assets in this arena? And can I rearrange them for higher effectiveness? Because it, there's too much in the US thinking that in order for anything to change, I must have more. I have to have more of something. I have to have more knowledge, more schooling, more technology, more space, more room. And in fact, we have so much of everything and if we will look instead to think about how we reconfigure what we already have, how we use it differently, how we draw it together in ways that make it have greater impact, this actually produces more interesting and sustainable change than the more is better approach. So I, let, I use this from New Orleans because, you know, musicians in New Orleans do not, and I, this is my speech to everybody that comes to work for us, you know, they don't wait for the audience to be there and the money to show up and the temperature to be right. And they come out, they open they, their case, and they start to play. And that, for me, is the way, you know, what you saw in New Orleans is that's what I witness again and again amongst community developers. And, you know, they don't wait to find out if someone's coming. They show up and they play. All right, so this is the final chapter. <laughs> You, here was Houston, 2000, and I'm planning, I, this is how I had everything planned. I had just gotten back from Australia. I had met with Queensland Fire and Emergency. We had been talking about how t-shirts and uniforms have to work together. They had just had another big flood, not quite as bad as the 2011, but pretty bad. Karen and I had celebrated and drunk a couple of martinis toasting the fact that we were still getting this work done in spite of everything. And I come back to Houston, and here comes Harvey. And Harvey starts, you know, sort of wandering, staggering along the Gulf Coast like some drunk at a party, right? Uh, bumping into everything, dropping a lot of water on us. And um, we all were sitting at home. When I say we, the folks I work with were sitting at home watching the water rise. And, um, and it was scary, and we're used to it, and we were really still scared because all of the people that were used to following all the wonderful uh, weather folks were saying, no, this is real, and it's different, and it's a lot bigger, and it's going to be a lot worse. And, you know, we, sometimes if you say bigger in Texas, people actually get a little fired up because they think, well, this might be worth our considerable muscle and power, uh, good on us. But in this case, we knew, because we know everything about hurricanes, we know what the dirty side is, and we know what the scent, we know how to wait for the center of the hurricane to pass. We know, we, this is our world. You know, I think in my lifetime, you know, my, the earliest hurricane, I was three, and when I was six, and then I, we used to throw a party 
we really did in Beaumont, Texas, in that little refinery town, because it was higher than Louisiana, and my relatives would come, and my uncle would bring his accordion in a red box. And when the red box came up the sidewalk, I knew it was going to be a good time. We made a gumbo. The water came in. The water went out. We went back to the way we used to live. Um, but that's when we had wetlands, and the storms weren't as big. And so here comes Harvey, and we had seen Allison, we knew what it could be like, and they were telling us it's way worse. So this was Houston. Um, I wish I had the photograph of what that's supposed to look like. Um, it's, it's roads. Um, and while they are meant to flood, they aren't meant to flood like that. And while this was happening, I get a call from Judge Ed Emmett, a dear friend of mine, uh, Judge Emmett, is uh, we call our highest ranking county official judge. They're not a judge in any courtroom sense of the word, but they're like a county commissioner, a county administrator, in charge and disaster. So uh, on August 29th, the judge called me and said, Angela, and it was just like the call I had gotten from Mayor White after Katrina, the same sort of flat, not too, uh, Mayor White I love, but he's the opposite of charismatic. And he, his instruction to me went along the lines of, we're going to need you. It's going to be big. We got a lot of people coming. Uh, you know what to do. And I kind of understood that. So when, when, when Ed called, he said, can you open a shelter? Can you open NRG as a shelter for 10,000 people? And I said, how long do I have? And he said, how long do you need? I said, 24 hours. So this was about... 10 o'clock in the morning, and I started putting out the word to the tribe. And everybody that, you know, were you, like the first question, are you wet or are you dry? Um, and, um, and then it, the word spread, and there were a couple of real fierce team members that I, I work with that I'm a little bit scared of. But um, they're really great for things like this, and I called them to make sure they could come because I knew they'd whip everything into shape. And by about two, we had a 250 people at NRG. NRG is a 700,000 square foot convention center. Um, one of the things we use it for is the Houston Livestock Show and Rodeo. <laughs> so we get about a million two visitors to that. And if you ever feel like you need to come and see the world's largest bull, you can join us for the rodeo. So. Um, so it's a big, big place, and we had started to lay it out as a shelter for 10,000 people. And at um, around 2 o'clock, uh, when, when all my team was there and we felt like we had that feeling like we might make this work, uh, the judge called back and said, are you going to be ready? Can you be ready sooner? And I said, what's sooner? He said, like today. And I said, this one, the, the same day we're in? And um, he said, yes, and I said, okay, if that's what we have to do, we do it. And so um, I promised him by 9 so he could announce on the press conference, and this is me saying it, at 7.22, we're ready. I was like, I may beat the deadline. Um, but we did that with volunteers, and um, this was the night I was most afraid, and I really don't bring it up to scare you, but only because I think we fail to grasp the interdependencies in the world we're in. Um, the Houston Ship Channel and the Texas Gulf Coast, 30% of all the energy you use in this country, we have to get up and go to work for you to have it. Uh, part of the reason when people were trying to drive out of Florida after the hurricane there, they couldn't get gasoline is because we couldn't send it to them. And so the biggest fear we have in Houston is a plant explosion on the port that would shut down the port. Because without the port of Houston, you can't build anything. With a, in terms of project tonnage, if you build something here, it probably came, some of it came through Houston. So that night, this plant um, did catch fire. Unfortunately, it's not one of the bigger ones. And then the Beaumont, where I'm from, where my mother uh, was, lost the water supply. 80, 120,000 people lived there. And I'm thinking, we, 
we don't have enough capacity if this gets worse. And I was really scared. So, um, so you know, I said 4 a.m. and I'm like, Judge, get up. You know, <laughs> you need to, you need to, you need to do something. Um, so it didn't turn out to be that bad. But so we opened NRG as a shelter. It was the 12th anniversary of Katrina, and this is a view from the window of NRG, and this is the Astrodome. So full circle. Uh, last four months of my tenure as CEO, I thought I was going to spend, you know, maybe going to margarita parties in my honor, uh, <laughs> hanging out with my pals, taking it easy, uh, you know, resting on laurels. And, and instead, this is what we were up to. And I think the, uh, the uh, you won't see many people here because I maintained a strict rule. Uh, we called people that came to the shelter, guests or neighbors, no other words. His words, the words we use when we describe the people we're helping really shape our attitudes toward them. And I wasn't having any of the language that we heard after Katrina. So uh, these are photographs we took with actually a drone that flies through this thing. Uh, we set up a dispensary, and the Shell Oil volunteers actually organized it so people didn't have to dig for what they need. They could come up and say what they needed, and it was bagged and given to them. Um, these are our, this is our team setting up the cots. This is the number, everything that I could think of we took care of. Food, we had a, we had a clinic, we had doctors, we had a child care and school area. Uh, first thing to do to stabilize a shelter, children first, always, always children first. Um, we were rocking it and then realized that the volunteer entrance was completely out of control because we had more, we had two volunteers to work there for every person in the shelter and that went on for days and this is what it looked like every day and every day I would go out with a bullhorn when we had all we need and explain that we loved them and cared about them and we were glad they cared about everyone and we didn't need them and come back tomorrow. So, um, and we said welcome uh, to people as they arrived. It, it's, a, it's a terrible thing to land in a shelter. Try never to do it. Uh, if somebody tells you to evacuate, go. That wouldn't have worked for Houston and thank God we didn't. Uh, that would have been a terrible mistake in this instance. Um, but when you can get away from a storm, do it. Because when you arrive at a shelter, the first thing they were met with is a wall of uniforms. And, um, and we did uh, check in 300 guns. And uh, we were happy to store those for people and tag them. And we gave them back when they left. As they left, got in the car, we gave them back. So meeting with this security was the first thing. And then after that, it was kind of a wall of t-shirts of people saying welcome. And we planned for the diversity in the city. Uh, we had uh, 24 languages, people that spoke 24 languages. We only needed 16. Um, so uh, these were uh, our translators, uh, uh, many of them my teammates. And those are our Earn, Learn, Belong t-shirts in case we forget what we're supposed to be doing. So um, this is to sum up the wisdom of all of this, um, the first phase is all about the uniforms. It's command and control. You work in hierarchical structures when you're trying to create safety and security. The second phase is all about collaboration and improvisation. And you work with t-shirts and anybody you can in any spaces you can using whatever you have. But these three sectors have to come together. All the really good, good um, responses to flows of people have all been at the intersection of uh, government and philanthropy and the nonprofit sector. These are the commandments of welcome and they're really simple and common sense. And this is going to wrap up my talk. This is as close as I ever get to bullet points. Uh, children first. If you want to stabilize a shelter, any group of people, make a planned place for children. We had staff that we knew had all of the staff that we normally use for the child care and Head Start centers that we operate came. Our charter school staff came. Um, create the small communities. Focus on strengths. One of the most disturbing things in Germany uh, that I heard was, you know, at first there was great excitement. Oh, good, we need workers. These people are coming, these workers, you know, and they're, they've got training. This is going to be good for us. 
And there's a German playwright that actually wrote, we wanted workers, people came instead. And what, what happened was they showed up with their families and their frailties and their knowledge and, their, and a disconnect between maybe what they knew and wanted to do and what was available. So a really strong strengths assessment, questions that you ask people when you're working with them about what they can do, what they are capable of, what they aspire to be. Um, residents and uh, the people in the shelters and camps and community centers are the first resource. Uh, we hired a lot of folks from New Orleans to help people from New Orleans. And that works pretty well for those that are less traumatized by the event. Uh, one of the ways, one of the reasons Majdi was so effective is that he understood the culture and the community, the pe places people came from. Um, the celebrating victories and accomplishments. Allow everything, art, volunteering, enterprise, allow it. One of my favorite <laughs> things about Zottery, the camp in, in uh, Jordan, is that at first you weren't supposed to have any enterprises there. There weren't supposed to be any businesses there. And then they decided, because they were popping up everywhere, they'd just give them all a permit. And then there was a street, and you just go down it, and there's a bit, little shops and stalls on, every, on both sides, and they call it the Champs-Élysées. They, they named it that in honor of the French doctors that helped them as they arrived. Um, but don't create restrictions. Every, all of those get expensive and cause isolation. This is probably the most important one, isolation. The sense that people are being written off, leaders have great power in cities to shape a narrative that includes everyone. And that's probably the most important role they pay, play. Because when you shape that narrative so everyone's included, it really diminishes uh, the sense of despair that people have. So if everybody has to fill out one stupid form, it's a big community event. And everyone that knows how to do it is lined up at tables. And you help everybody at once, and you get it over with. That's the way to feed a bureaucracy as turning it into a celebration. Um, so that's it. This is my belief. I think the cities of the future um, that will have the greatest success will be those that figure out what to do with flows of people, how to create welcoming places, how to make sure the people that are already there feel welcome, can walk down the street, how to weave a narrative about a city that includes everyone. So. <laughs> That's all I got. <laughs> oh, ah, so that's a good a Houston riddle. How many, how many folks does it take to float a pickup truck? <laughs> One from every country. So, yeah. All right. Anything else? Did I, did, did I do what I'm supposed to do tonight? <laughs> yeah. Um, you said at the beginning how Houston learned from Allison yeah. and changed how it how it is some of its building. And, yeah. and I've heard that also about Florida, that it's been hit by some yeah. hurricanes, that it's learned from that as it makes it a little bit more resilient, at least physically, maybe also sort of culturally and institutionally. Um, Rhode Island has been pretty lucky. So far, we haven't, we've been hit by hurricanes, but nothing that terrible. Um, and so maybe that also, from that lens, it makes us a little bit um, less yeah. resilient. So how do we, how do we prepare without having to learn from experience? How could we, at, at, because we don't, I think, you know, you, you see an event like Harvey and you want the place that, that was in Houston to learn from that, yes. and it doesn't happen, right? And we're kind of fixated on it really? for a couple weeks, and, so then, and then no, and then we that. just keep so, I don't know, do you have thoughts yeah. for, for here? Well, even, here's a troubling thing, and I think this is what we must face. I, I, I remember when I thought recover, I thought preparedness was the answer, and I thought changing policies were the answer, and, and uh, changing how we built was the answer. And then I said, well, we're probably not going to be able to do that as well or as fast. We can't really recreate this city even further from the Gulf. So then I thought recovery was the thing I should be thinking about. The storm is, how do we get back on our feet as quickly as possible? And now I'm coming to accept 
that in cities around the world, we will live with water. We will live with it. It will come. And the seas are rising. This is nothing. We, we can't do a thing about it. So it's the acceptance of the new reality. Because even in our planning and thinking before, we corrected for the last storm. We built everything off of what we just saw. We said, well, when I, you know, if we ever have another Allison, no worries, because we've sealed off everything in the basements of every major institution, and we're good to go. Then we had Harvey. So I think the, I think the water's coming, and I don't think we can prepare. I, do, I don't think we should go on being absolutely foolish and wasteful and continue building right where we know absolutely things will be washed away. Um, but this is the world we're in. The, the reason this work is so important to me at this time is that more and more people are going to be displaced by war or weather, losing health or wealth. People are adrift. Uh, I mean, our numbers for people displaced in the world, if you added all the people in the United States that have no home to that, and you add, I mean, really the truth about where people not in their own communities, not in their own homes, that number is really high. So uh, I think the work is to figure out how to create landing places uh, for people. So does that sound dismal? <laughs> Look, there's crazy people in Houston. They're just going right on, you know. They're just raising it 12 feet, thinking they got it, you know? So, I mean, I don't know. Humans, what are you going to do? What are you going to It's an imperfect species. So, yeah, I would hope that people could learn. I would hope. Uh, we, we knew after Ike we needed to build a dike. Uh, at the, at the, where is, I don't want to explain the whole geography, but the Galveston Bay, the ship channel, that whole area is completely unprotected and the, sh the, s the storm we fear isn't the one we had. The storm we fear is the hurricane that comes up the ship channel because then every we'll have to go live in Dallas and I don't know if you know anything about Texas but we don't like Dallas. <laughs> <laughs> if you live in Houston, we, you don't like Dallas just automatically. We don't. It's like they're weird. They want to be New Yorkers. Yeah. Noam, he's, he helped us with the community engagement for years and still is. So, yeah. I so, I know a little bit about appreciative inquiry and yeah. you embody that. The, yeah. the, the looking for the assets, the looking for um, what you want more of. And um, you just must be a master at the reframe in terms of um, all the, the destitution that you see. And I just would love to hear you talk about how you do that. Um, how you get people to, you know, turn from the torment in their past to a future? Well, I think I learned that from them as much as what I do with them. Um, I think that I really believe the human spirit is not extinguishable. We have to do, we have to put a great deal of effort into it to um, convince people they're worthless. There's something in us that wants to be a part of the world we're in. So, but I think what I most have to do often is reframe it for the people who are trying to help. So one of the, my short <laughs> phrases, because you know, I have to talk to people that don't really like to listen to me that much. <laughs> Y'all have been so sweet. <laughs> it's usually over a lot shorter at home. Um, but it ain't help if they didn't ask. That's the first thing. If, they, if you're there to revitalize and help and fix up and decor, redecorate somebody's neighborhood or camp or community center, that ain't help if they didn't ask. Go where you're invited, do what you're asked to do. And then listen twice, you know, the old measure twice, cut once. Uh, listen twice, help once. So one of the power, the power behind appreciative inquiry is a methodology of, uh, to, as an approach to studying people or systems or neighborhoods or families or community, whatever. McKinsey uses it to do process design. Doesn't that sound awful? <laughs> <laughs> but the great beauty of it is it's so energizing. Um, and, you know, we were really put to the test with that perspective as people arrived from New Orleans because we had just begun saying, you know, whatever the 
uh, funders require, you know, the stack of the needs assessment, lacks, gaps, needs, wants, the, it was like the whole litany of everything wrong with these people. We're going to start with the questions that matter most. What matters most to you? What is your hope? What are your hopes and dreams for your children? What is the one thing you wish you could learn or do? What's the one skill you have that you know if you could teach it, others would want to learn it? A whole host of things like, what's the one thing that makes this neighborhood that everybody thinks is a bad neighborhood a great place for you to live? What makes it feel like home? Those kinds of questions, we determine that's where we're going to stick with that. And we chronicle all this with the same rigor that most people count up the problems. So when, when Katrina happened and now these people are arriving, and you know, there's, there's someone sitting across from you and they've got a t-shirt and a photograph and that's what they've saved. And it's a really test, are you going to start there? Are you really going to start with what did they save? And what can they do? And who do they know? And what resources do they have that might be put to use to rebuild a life? And we did. Um, now, we don't do this insensitively. Uh, people tell their stories first. People want to tell you how they made it to where they are, what they survived and so forth, but when it comes to what we write down, it's an inventory of what they're like when they're at their strongest, at their best. And one of my favorite questions that one of our, my teammates would often ask is, can you tell me about another time in your life where you went through something really difficult like this? Tell me what got you through. It's a reminding people of the sources of their own strength and support. And so, you know, like, uh, sometimes it's hard to remember that people, well, so sometimes I have to explain this stuff to billionaires. That, I do like explaining stuff to billionaires. Because <laughs> they have, like, if you explain it real good, you know, something good comes of that. But <laughs> you have. Yeah, I mean, well. You tell a different story yeah. than a lot of nonprofits. Well, well, you don't tell one about how you need to go in and fix them. I mean, yeah. Well, here's a problem, and we're going to solve it. Yeah. But the nonprofit narrative is this is something terrible, awful, tragic, and, and, and so forth. And can you give me some money so I can take care of it? And then next year we come back, and well, it's even worse this year. We need some more money. Um, and, you know, so that doesn't really go anywhere, and it's exhausting. But I will just tell you this small thing. The main reason I don't do that is that, you know, the first time I read one of those case studies in a textbook that sounded just like my family, I actually just sort of quickly put my hand over it because in some way I imagined my mother reading that version of us and how hurtful that would be to think that someone had distilled our life into that set of facts and statistics. So. Um, you know, there's been a lot of practices for many deficit-based systems. We have whole systems that say, show up and prove to me how broken you are, and we'll dole out a little help. It's not quite going to be enough, and it won't be transformational, but, you know, we, we can say we did something. Uh, it's harmful. It's harmful. So we try not to do that. <laughs> try not to do that. I like the comments you made about New Orleans, and um, I do think I often find in neighborhoods considered poor, uh, places that are considered problematic, uh, there's always a great ability to improvise, to imagine, to create, to work together, to fashion what you're wanting out of, the, out of what you've got. So I think those are really some of the strengths that you consistently see. Um, my father actually taught me the only thing really to fear is hopelessness and the notion that tomorrow will be just like today and there's no place for me to go. My, my passion for this work stems from I really still believe that if you plant somehow your dream in this like mixed up place, this mixed up country, that, and you work really hard, you can start one place and end up someplace else. And I just want that to stay true. I bet you do too. Yeah. I, I don't like people tell me people are always talking about income equality, how many poor people I don't really care how many poor people there are. I just don't. And the reason is because I have, no matter how much I know about that, that's not gonna help. What I really care about is if is there any place for them to go. 
Is it a life sentence or is it a temporary situation? And, um, you know, I've seen a lot of families turn, turn things, um, turn their lives into something really worth celebrating. Okay. Can you mind talking a bit more about these gatherings? These are gatherings you have, monthly gatherings you have at your house? Okay, so uh, it's not my house. Um, oh. Like I'm just renting a little place, but in the sort of, like I don't know what you call them when it's not a basement, but it, it's right. got windows that's kind of halfway in the halfway basement. So at the bottom, yeah, of this house is a, a like a meeting space, like, you know, a little living room and table stuff area. So um, uh, you guys have a, you know, space, every place is kind of filled. And I wanted to make sure that um, I just had a place for, to meet with people who wanted to talk about their work or mine or anything else. Yeah, so four o'clock. You know, this is a very Cajun thing to do, you know. It doesn't have an agenda, <laughs> has a rough time, there'll be some food, you don't have to know what's gonna, how it's going to turn out. You just show up and see what happens. Yeah. What's the address? 127 Waterman. It's the blue, it's blue, and you kind of have to go around to the back to find that door that goes to the, the bottommost area. So what day? Thursday at 4 o'clock until it gets dull and then we have to home. Yeah. <laughs> All right. How would that's my this is my second talk at Brown and I still have a job. Woo. Woo. Like, am I good? <laughs> so I wanna say thank you to Giovanna. Can you like wait she's such a cool chick there. Um, uh, she uh, she has held my hand literally while I um, you know, had a huge meltdown over technology problems. So the only reason you got all these pretty pictures tonight is because of her. So thank you. Thank you very much. And thanks to Tony for making me welcome and Deb for making me come and all the rest of you. I look forward to hanging out with you. All right? Bye.